que nada, agradezco la oportunidad de este, eh, del comité para estar aquí. Eh, este es el proyecto de maestría que estoy desarrollando en el laboratorio del doctor Luis Concha. Y, pues bueno, empecemos. The title of this uh, project is White Matter Microstructure Evaluation of Crossing Fever Regions Through Diffusion Magnetic Resonance. And, and the objective is to determine white matter biomarkers through diffusion MRI that allow us to infer microstructural features in crossing fever regions. Um, but first, I'm going to be to jump some of the slides, but what is diffusion magnetic resonance? It's a technique that um, could uh, bring us information about the microstructural environment uh, present in the tissue. If you have here a uh, normal uh, diffusion weighted image, and I'm going to jump this, uh, but this is important, the diffusion phenomena. Um, diffusion MRI has its basis in the uh, phenomenon of diffusion. We understand uh, diffusion as the random movement of water molecules um, at a temperature above uh, zero Kelvin. And I'm going to uh, give you an example of this with an analogy that I think that it is uh, very helpful to understand the diffusion. Um, if you uh, drop a little bit of ink in a clinic, the diffusion profile of those molecules is going to be isometric, uh, isotropic. Um, I mean, uh, there is uh, the same uh, probability uh, for these molecules to diffuse to all the sites. But for example, if we change the um, tissue, and now we talk about a newspaper, and then we drop a little bit of ink, the configuration of the fibers present in that um, tissue is going to impose constraints to the diffusion, so we are going to have a preferential diffusion profile. Uh, and let's jump to a uh, um, 3D environment. Um, for example, in a glass, uh, in a glass uh, if we put water, the water molecules are going to diffuse with an isotropic uh, profile. So but what happens in the brain? The point, uh, the point in this picture is that we have um, different kinds of tissues that uh, depending on the fibers of this uh, tissue, um, this material imposes constraints, uh, constraints to the diffusion profile. So in the brain is the same. We have uh, axons, diffusion MRI is mainly used uh, for evaluating white matter microstructures. And these axons impose, uh, impose constraints to the diffusion profile of the water molecules. Why? Because these axons has uh, have membranes and also myelin sheets, and we have constrictions, uh, so the diffusion profile is anisotropic in this case. Um, and in diffusion MRI, we make uh, measurements in different directions, and we put this information in voxels that are the main units of the diffusion weighted images. And um, if we um, me uh, make the measurement in the same direction of the fibers, we are going to have hypo-intensive boxes because uh, the water is, is uh, in movement. So it is going to be harder uh, to see these, uh, these molecules than in the case of that we make um, the measurement in a different direction. For example, in this slice, this is a slice of uh, a human brain and, and in this case, we are making the measurement in an orthogonal direction. So uh, diffusion MRI uh, is very important in clinic and scientific research. It helps to estimate normal human brain development. Uh, also, it brings support in medical diagnosis, and it could be helpful in, in evaluation of uh, structural networks, among other applications. But we, we have the diffusion weighted images, but we need, uh, we want information. Uh, for that, we need to use mathematical models to analyze these images. Uh, one of them is Axe Caliber, Node, CSD, Cubal Imaging, uh, MRGS, developed here in this map. And, come on, jump. Ah. And one of them is the tensor model. 
This model uh, has been widely used because it is easy to interpret and also the acquisition times are reasonable. So these uh, features make it uh, available in the clinic. We can use these models in the clinic and this is important because as I mentioned before, uh, there is relevant in that. Uh, now, the problem with this model is that it does not allow us uh, to estimate crossing fever regions. I mean, in a diffusion weighted image, we have uh, the 90% of the voxels present crossing fever regions. So we need uh, more advanced, uh, advanced models. And I'm going to talk, I mentioned some alternatives before, but I'm going to talk about uh, these alternatives because they are involved in the project in which we are working on um, CSD uh, and MRDS and in the future maybe you are also be working with Diamond. Um, but the point is that, yeah, we have a problem, no? this problem about the crossing fever regions and we have some alternatives, some mathematical approximations, but we need validation. We need to validate this and we need to know um, the biological background present uh, in this area. So what we are going to do um, is going to use a model of axonal degeneration and select a crossing fever region. After of that, we are going to make an MRI acquisition. And just after of that, we are going to make uh, the histology of that part because uh, if we have the histology, we have the biological background. And so I'm going to mention just this is very fast. Uh, we have, um, this is the model that we are going to use. Well, this is the representation of the region in which we are interested on is the optic chiasm. But uh, we have here in the eye and the retina. In the retina we found and uh, retinal ganglion cells that project uh, through the optic nerve. It goes to the optic chiasm and it follows its way uh, through the optic tract. And we have here so um, a single fiber region and in the optic chiasm, we have two different populations of fibers. And I'm going to stress that it, uh, the selection of this model um, it's very good because we have just uh, a reduction of the problem because we have just uh, two populations of fibers and also we can manipulate these populations. How in this way we, um, we use uh, Wister rats and we cannulate the anterior chamber of the eye. You ele uh, we elevated the pressure to 120 millimeters of mercury so we induce the generation in the retinal ganglion cells. These cells um, degenerate through uh, valerian degeneration. And so a mathematical model uh, should evaluate uh, the tissue in a normal condition, but also in, the, in a condition with the degeneration. And we have a sample of uh, 50 animals, the experimental group are comp is composed by 10 animals. So, these are the steps I have mentioned. We have a biological model. Uh, after of that, we made the MRI acquisition, and then the mathematical analysis, and after of that, the histology to have the biological background of that uh, region. The acquisition parameters, uh, well, uh, we used a uh, 7 Tesla Brooker Pharma scan. This is an ex vivo acquisition. And the size of our voxels is uh, 125 micrometers uh, isometric. And we used two shells of HD directions, one of uh, 2000, the other of 2500, and also 20V0 images. And um, yeah, and this is. Uh, an axial slice of the rad brain uh, with the per protein thing. Um, and now we can see, I think, yes, there is. So yeah, we have this. We have then again, no, a single fiber region. We are interested in, in these two regions uh, for the moment, uh, the optic uh, nerve and then the optic chiasm. 
in the optic nerve, we um, find just one single fiber population, and in the optic chiasm, we have a few pop uh, two different populations of fibers. And for the moment, I'm going to present uh, results about CSD, and um, I'm going to talk about the geometric interpretation of this model. If we, in the hypo hypothetical case that we have just one axon in a boxer, uh, it's just a hypothesis. Um, we, uh, with this model, we just uh, have one stick, no? There is one axon, one stick. In the case of that uh, optic chiasm, for example, uh, a voxel that contains two different fiber, two different populations, we uh, would have two sticks. But the point is that it doesn't happen in this way. No, we have distributions of um, different directions uh, because we are not going to have just one axon in one voxel. We have different axons going uh, in different directions. So if we wrap this, we have the classical um, representation of the uh, of CSD that are uh, these lobes, no? For uh, one single fiber region and also for two uh, regions. And I'm just going to show you um, this image. In this image, we can see here, for example, the estimation of the lobe that uh, it should decode the uh, fiber orientation distribu the distributions, FOD. And we have this, we can see here, this the corpus, cal uh, the corpus callosum of the rat brain. And yeah, but the point is, yeah, this is a, a normal condition, but what happens with this uh, structure of crossing fever regions in the presence of degeneration? And uh, CSD has its own um, metrics uh, to um, bring us information about that issue. Um, one, of the, one of them is apparent fiber density, that it is, um, these metrics are estimated based on the geometric properties of the lobe, no? So uh, apparent fiber density refers to the volume of that lobe. If we obtain the integral of that lobe, we get this value. Of course, uh, this value is going to be lower in a single fiber region and it is going to be higher in a crossing fiber region. Uh, we also have another metric. We have different metrics I'm going I'm just going to, uh, talking about these two metrics, complexity. That complexity indicates, as its name says, uh, the level of complexity present in each voxel. Um, for example, in the case that we have only a single fiber region, we have a level of complexity of zero. Uh, this is the ideal case. Uh, but if the complexity increase, this value also increase. If the, uh, we have more than one, population and there is symmetry uh, among the lobes, we are going to have a higher value. So um, this uh, part of the results that I want to show you. In the control group, we can see here in the optic nerves of, and uh, this is a coronal view of our rat brain. Um, and in this case, we have the optic nerves and we have here, um, one of the uh, possible lobes that could be in this uh, region. But um, remember that we have the histological background of this. We have this histology here. You can see the axon profile in this uh, micrography. And, and uh, you can see that the axons are intact. But what happens in the case of the generation? In the case of the generation, we do not have just the uh, Diffusion, the contribution of diffusion of the water that is going parallel to the orientation of the fibers. We have something else. Why? Because there is a project, uh, process of the generation. The um, membranes of that uh, of those axons and also the myelin sheets are degenerated. We can see uh, very clear here the difference. And but. This is about the optic nerve. It's a single fiber region, but what happens in a crossing fiber region? And I love this picture because you can see here in the control group that there is a presence of uh, two different fiber populations, but what happens 
in the ischemic group. No, you can see that there is uh, in one of the boxes that are in these uh, structures, you can see the contribution of just one um, of just one population that corresponds to the intact nerve, but not uh, the presence of the other population that uh, it is the corresponds to the degenerated nerve. And we also have the histology the, in the control group. We can see this profile that is very similar to the intact nerve, but in the, ca in the case of the ischemic group, we uh, see a lot of degeneration in this uh, region. But also, there is a mixture because, uh, as I uh, told you before, um, this is a crossing uh, fever region. So we have one, uh, the presence of the axons, um, of the intact axons, and also the presence of the degenerated axons. So um, there is a contribution of two different populations. And in this figure, I'm just going to tell you about the results uh, running with the tensor model. The, the tensor model can estimate, uh, can differentiate uh, um, between the intact optic nerve and the affected one. But in the case of the optic chiasm, it fails. But um, in the case of complexity, that was one of the metrics that I talked to you about, you can see that as we expect in the case of the optic nerve, this level is very low, um, um, but it goes higher in the affected nerve. But if, uh, if we remember, there is a contribution to the diffusion profile of something else. Uh, and in the optic chiasm, we have a higher level of complexity in the control group compared with the ischemic group because in the ischemic group, we have uh, the presence mainly of just one population of fibers. The other one is degenerated. And uh, in this uh, graph, in the um, y-axis, you have the levels of FA and apparent fiber density, fractional anisotropy, uh, and complexity. And in black, you have uh, the control group, and in orange, the experimental group. In the x-axis, you have uh, the different regions in which we are interested on, the normal nerve, the affected one, and the optic chiasm. And, uh, well, I'm not going to talk about FA, but uh, apparent fiber density, uh, we have problems with apparent fiber density because we are not obtaining the <laughs> very good results. However, in the case of complexity, no, we are not engaged with any of these models, we are making validation. We have a state of data, no, uh, an acquisition, an MRI acquisition, and also the uh, correspond histology. So we are just showing uh, how a particular model, PSD, develop and um, perform in this region. And in the, in the case of um, apparent fiber density, we cannot uh, distinguish among the two different groups. But in the case of complexity, as I told you before, in the uh, uh, normal nerve, we have a low value. This goes higher in the case of the experimental group. And in the case also in the experimental group, it goes down because I told you before, the level of complexity in the optic chiasm of the experimental group is reduced. And this is a very important slide. And because it talks about this uh, analysis that is run through mathematical models, and also uh, it uh, talks to you about the biological background in which we are interested on. And, and this is about axon density that you can see um, this in the x-axis. And in the y-axis, you have uh, the level of uh, apparent fiber density and also the level of complexity that if you have, for example, in, in the optic nerve that are the um, black squares, um, if you have uh, a few um, population, a uh, few quantity of axons, so it, it means that this nerve is degenerated, so the complexity level is going to be uh, higher. And 
if you have an X intact nerve, the level of complexity is going to be reduced. But in the, ca in the case of the chiasm, um, if you have a normal chiasm, uh, you are going to have more axons. So the levels of complexity are going to be higher compared to the levels of, uh, levels of complexity of the uh, degenerated chiasm. And we need to make the complete correlations to histology. We are using axon tech for that, a uh, software that can make uh, axon segmentation. The MRI acquisition is ready, and also the analysis with CSD. And we also have this, uh, I, this is good. <laughs> we also have this special set of data. I'm very proud of it because there are two shells. Uh, of 80, direction, uh, 80 directions, one B value of uh, 3,000 and um, the other of 5,000. Yeah, and that's it, the acknowledgement. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay, abrimos espacio para preguntas. I have two questions. One that is really a naive question because I don't have so much expertise and the other one may be more tricky. So the, <laughs> <laughs> so, so the naive question is you have two shells and you have an acquisition with uh, once I think 2,000 and 2,400 and then we're here with 2,000 and 5,000. I always thought that one, one would want to have three shells instead of two. Why d w it's just for me to understand why do you go for this specific shell design and what is the benefit specifically also including um, the devalue okay. system one of the benefits uh, for example talking about uh, csd is, is that we can have um, um, more precise estimation of the um, of the f of this and quite higher why higher than 2000 and 2000 and uh, 500 because we need to consider that this is an ex vivo acquisition. So um, in an ex vivo acquisition, the diffusion phenomena is different than in an in, in vivo acquisition. So we need a higher V value to see uh, a better profile no, in these boxes. Need to make more averages because of noise. Would that be the case? Uh, in this case, we f uh, when in the case of the um, um, ex vivo acquisition, the images are pretty good, so it, it don't need a second one. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, <laughs> then the second question is: uh, How do you ensure correspondence across the different um, ad across the different animals with respect to where you select where the optic chiasm is? Is there is there variability in, in defining what the optic chiasm is, and could that also affect your findings somehow, or can you show that your findings are reproducible no matter how you define the optic chiasm? How did you define the optic chiasm? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, because uh, for the moment we are only uh, making an. Um, let's say, uh, anatomical supported uh, um, selection of this region, but um, w oh, well, the, uh, the team in which uh, I'm working on is working on algorithms, on mathematical algorithms, uh, Alonso and Ricardo, <laughs> uh, to estimate uh, the corrosive fever region. Yeah, but because uh, yeah, this, there is a problem, you can select the region that you want, mm -hmm. no? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I would like to say something very quickly. So the 2000 and 2000, uh, uh, 20, 2500 uh, B values is about, because we developed like four years ago, a multi-tensor uh, algorithm, but we tested in healthy tissue. So we uh, optimized the protocol for healthy tissue and we got those numbers for, for that model was the best. So now we are working with uh, damaged tissue. And for the damaged tissue, we are also optimizing the protocol. That's, uh, that's why I'm sure that could be the case that we need maybe three or four shells. N uh, until now, we are still, it's an ongoing work. Mm -hmm. But that's the origin of the 2,000 and 2,500. 2, 2, 20, 20, uh, but 
uh, I think is going to change because now we are talking about isotropic diffusion. Then we need uh, B value smaller, maybe 500, mm -hmm. something like that. But we are optimizing that. Something but like that's move, exactly, move exactly. Yeah. Something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Más preguntas. Ah, Raúl. Uh, hey, very nice work. I have a, it's more like a comment than a question. When you're calculating the prime fiber density, it depends of how you model it. How many seeds do you do? Uh, if you're using constraint tractography, I think you should filter the results in order to you have more like reproducible uh, data, so you can see some what you're expecting. Because what I, I saw in that graph is that you have a lot of var variability that might be explained because of the technique and the way you create this, the, the tracks there? In this case, we are not making tractography. We are only selected, uh, selecting one region, no? uh, for in this case, no, the optic chiasm. And yeah, but yeah, no, we are not making tractography. Yeah, it is uh, just a region of interest. Maybe that is not the best image to show that, but it is just a, a region of interest and we are extracting some value of that region, in this case, um, apparent fiber density and complexity. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No? Okay, thank you very much, Gil. Very nice presentation.